Welcome to the All Out Coach podcast, everyone. This is the place where we approach every conversation as a point of reference and also as inspiration. And we extend the boundaries of our roles and responsibilities. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, building and belonging to teams. And I have a guest with whom I'm going to chat that I'm very excited to hear from. Uh, his name is Rohit Sud. He's the executive vice president at Eversana of commercialization. And he is an expert, considered a pharmaceutical industry scholar, uh, a professor at Rutgers Business School, where he was recognized for an alumni association prize. He spent many years at Sineos helping companies launch their products. He's an expert in product launches. And he advises a number of global companies on growth strategies. I had a chance to speak to him a few months ago. And uh, what struck me was his evident intention to connect, to connect on an emotional level and to understand how to find common ground. And, you know, as I read uh, some of the ways that others who have worked with him describe him before this podcast, what came clear was his thoughtfulness in other people's remarks, his openness to new ideas. And also one very important comment that I saw, Rohit, which was that your success is the product of you building successful teams. And speaking of successful teams and also a sports inspiration in the spirit of the Olympics this week, uh, I'll mention to everyone that I learned that Rohit Sud also ran an ultra marathon, which I can't even imagine doing. Uh, I think 5K is the most that I've ever run, but he ran uh, over 150 miles, I believe, over a course of six days. So he'll tell us more about that. And I just want to welcome you, Rohit, to uh, All Our Coach. It's a pleasure to have you. Tim, that was a very generous introduction, and that ultra marathon was a lifetime away. But it was a highlight of uh, some of the experiences that I've had the privilege of having over the last two or three decades. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm very passionate about team building and people. Uh, I feel like a lot of our businesses are about people, and if you take care of teams and build teams appropriately, uh, you know it kind of takes away a lot of the stress about being successful. So it's, I think Richard Branson had a really good saying, uh, take care of your people and they will take care of the business. And I, uh, I do believe in that philosophy. Yeah. I didn't share all of your highlights and accomplishments. So feel free to take us a little bit through your path of some of the strongest teams that you had a chance of working uh, with uh, leading as well. Yeah, so I've been I've had a privilege of being part of many teams and teams either in the professional world or in the athletic world. Uh, I was part of a swimming team. I played squash, uh, so I was part of a, a squash team uh, in my junior senior year in in university. Um, I think there are some common principles or philosophies or characteristics that I've seen in uh, in teams that I've enjoyed being a part of, and that have all, have also shaped in how I think about building teams. I think the best part was the level of honesty, you know, the culture of honesty and really constructive feedback is something that resonated was a singular thread across all the good teams that I've had, whether that was from a coach who was a leader of the team and getting you motivated or whether it was a manager. So there are a lot of similarities around that. So culture was very critical. Uh, the ability to speak your mind, talk about what you're struggling with and then being coached and mentored into solving that issue that you were trying to address, you know, whether it's a shot or whether it's a specific uh, technical issue at work, uh, or when you become a manager, when you're managing a team for the first time, having someone coaching you through the people aspect of managing a team. Um, I think in my, if I look at my senior uh, uh, experiences and my experiences in the technology side, going back to having good mentors and good leaders who care about you and care about your success uh, made also a huge difference. And I've had been very lucky to have some amazing mentors from day one at what was Campbell Alliance to when we became Sineos, 
I've had mentors who weren't even in my reporting line. They were in other businesses that I could reach out to and 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 we become friends now. Uh, you know, there's a very good mentor of mine who is now a chief commercial officer at a biotech company in Boston. And I enjoy having a conversation about his experiences and what I should be thinking about. So if you start thinking about teams across different organizations, uh, you know, these are some of the common uh, threads that you will see, you know, a good leader, a culture that feels inclusive, and, and someone who's looking out for you. Reading about how other people describe you uh, demonstrates to me that you are one of those leaders that practices what they preach. And, uh, you know, it's, it's for many, I think, it may be surprising because here, uh, here you are, an expert in helping large global organizations uh, turn their companies around, grow, uh, launch their products, right, with very uh, tangible results. But at the same time, you deeply care about how these results are obtained. Uh, in fact, one of the courses that you and I talked about was the MIT organizational change. And so, and so it's clear that you talk about this uh, in, uh, very passionately, and, and that's what I think differentiates you from among many other people who have similar roles, leading commercialization teams, for example, or drug commercialization. So uh, in terms of your mentorship, how do you uh, mentor other leaders in terms of building their teams? What are the key principles to building a team, Rohit? I think about like, what is the objective? Why, why does that team exist first, right? And I, I think we, we all have strengths and, and areas that we can always do better. There is no perfect leader or manager, right? Everyone has areas that they can always do better. And there are different mindsets around. Do you focus on what you're good at or you balance out with good and areas you need to develop? And, you know, it's a kind of a debate between strategy and tactics. No one really wins. Uh, you've mm -hmm. just got to focus on the right things. Do we have a vision that everyone aligns on, right? Uh, is, is something that we've co-created together or as a leader, you build a vision that this is what I want the team to focus on and then making sure people in your team understand that and they believe in it. There's a, as you start hiring team members, you have to also make sure that as a leader, you have to think about the kind of culture that you're creating with that vision in mind. And then making sure that team fits within the culture. Uh, at Eversana, I've had the opportunity to build a team from scratch. And I will tell you, building a team from scratch is in some cases easier than when you inherit a team that you have to turn around. It requires different muscles to kind of focus on and a different skill set. And they're both equally rewarding. And at Eversana, what we've tried to do is focus on bringing in professionals that have very similar aspirations and similar ways of working. So we focus a lot on the cultural fit rather than the technical capabilities. And so that's been something that I have learned over the years on how we think about building a team. You know, there's a vision aspect, there's a, uh, a culture aspect. The other area that I often think about is, you know, you have to provide feedback. As I had mentioned earlier, my best mentors have, are the ones that made you think, that helped you solve a problem or gave you a nudge in the right direction so you could solve the problem on your own. Mm -hmm. I think that this, this word consequences are used often, right? Positive and in a negative consequence. Um, we have to make sure that we hold our team accountable, yeah. right? And also then understanding what's behind that accountability. And then also making sure that they get compensated the right way. So there are many layers to this, mm -hmm. but the vision and culture is where it starts. So if you get the vision right and you focus on having the right culture, a lot of these things get taken care of as a consequence of that. Now, how do you put a structure around it? What does a structure of a team then look like? Given all these, that's factors. a great question, Tim. I think it's it's that's there's so many different ways to answer that question. I I will tell you, I typically like a flat structure, but a flat mm -hmm. structure also limits how you can scale. So we again start with what is the objective and 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 of the team, what is the vision of the team, 
what are you as a leader? What are your strengths and where are the gaps in your capabilities? And how do you build a team around you so that you become like one unit? Mm -hmm. And that's really where we focus on hierarchy and tends to get a bad rap, yeah. right? The reality is you need hierarchy to scale. Uh -huh. But how you manage within the hierarchy and how you empower people within the hierarchy is really critical to the success of the team. Mm -hmm. So if you have a leader, I have an in incredible uh, manager right now uh, who, when I need something, it's a phone call away. We don't meet every day. We probably speak to each other once or twice a week about topics related to what we're trying to do. Uh, but I feel a lot of freedom in what I'm, what, what he hired me to do. And so when you have a leader that treats you that way, you then pay it forward by hiring team members, making sure that they are empowered to make decisions and that they pull you in when they feel they need to. Mm -hmm. And you will get it wrong sometimes. My team gets it wrong once in a while, but it's not about like, okay, we got it wrong. You then shift again, going back to the culture of having a, how do we solve it? right? Because you make a mistake, you already feel bad about it if you hired the right people. Right. So just pointing fingers or, or, or having that kind of a mindset doesn't really benefit anyone. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking a step back and you're thinking about how do we make sure, okay, we know what went wrong. How do we make sure we solve that problem? How do we make sure we learn from it so we don't make the mistake again? Right. If you focus on those two aspects, you have a very, very uh, effective team. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you have a very long-term vision. It takes probably a long-term vision and a lot of patience as a leader to, to build and, and manage a team, right? That works through those trials and tribulations. Uh, patience is a key word, uh, Tim. I think, uh, you know, you have to find the right people, the whole recruiting process to get the right person on the team to a kind of complement your skill set. It takes time. And we've been very patient in our team in the complete commercialization team to hire the right people. And I'll tell you, my, my leadership team is incredible. I, I, it's, a, it's fun to wake up in the morning and go to work and have a conversation. We debate about things. We disagree on things. Uh, and I, it, but it's fun. It's not like we take these things personally and we are passionate about our beliefs, mm -hmm. but it is exciting to work with the team. And it's taken us a, a year to find all the right pieces. And there are still some pieces we have to build in 2022, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a, it's the pay, the word patience that you mentioned that completely resonated because it is, it takes time and you are going to uh, have some missteps. You know, recruiting is an art. So sometimes you don't find the right people. I, I've made some mistakes in my career where someone looked really good on paper, interviewed right. really well, was a wrong fit, mm -hmm. right? And we've all had those experiences. Uh, what I've learned from those experiences is that cultural fit is really critical. So focus on that a lot more. And then two, if someone's not a fit, then you have to make a decision on what you need to do with that person. Yeah. And those are some hard choices you have to make as a leader. Mm -hmm. Many teams, they're diverse also. They bring each individual player or uh, member probably brings their own universe and their own ideas. Why do teams with best products and best performers uh, fail sometimes? That's an interesting question. It's not that straightforward. I think it, it could be that we were focusing on the technical aspects of a product rather than problem solving, collaboration, communication, and, and teamwork mm -hmm. on how we took something to market. It could mean that we weren't listening to each other when someone was trying to tell you that either a feature of a product or a service or solution that you were creating or a process that you might be designing may not work or there are flaws in it, right? Often, we think we heard someone, right. but we may not be listening to what they're saying. And so those are some of the things that I, we tend to pay attention to here a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm, we're working on through one situation right now where our teams are, there's something missing in the communication. So we're bringing everyone together, mm -hmm. saying we don't want to have these back channel conversations. Let's put stuff on the table. Let's talk about what needs to be done. Let's hear the different points of view. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and then make a decision. And once that decision is made, everyone needs to go execute, right or wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this idea, shift, right? yeah, it's time. Yeah. It's time. And and one of our leaders that I had the privilege of working uh, about a, a decade ago, you know, he told me that when we come and make a decision, we need to listen to people. There's what he called time for public comments. You know, you listen and you hear what people are saying. But then once he made the decision, people had to either execute or leave. There's no in between. And so that kind of resonated with me. But but the, the key is that you've got to make sure people are included, mm -hmm. that folks are you're hearing what they're saying. Uh, and, and dissent is really critical. You want to create an environment with, where team members feel very comfortable about sharing um, why they think something may not work. You know, I heard this phrase being shared. Uh, uh, one of our key HR leaders shared with me this, this phrase called psychological safety. And that right. got me thinking about this. Uh, I think this was one of those ideas that was first explored, I think probably in the 60s, but has come now become a really important aspect. And I think Google was, I think that's where this, in the context of Google works, that's where this concept was shared. And, and people have to feel safe that if they disagree with you, that it's a point of view, right? It's not personal. And when conversations go into personal, that's where you as a leader have to kind of de-escalate the, the emotions and focus on what are we trying to solve and get back to the intent of that discussion and then get everyone focused on it. Because sometimes passions will take over. It's your human yeah. beings. It happens, right. Yeah. Yeah. right? But going back <clears throat> to your question is making sure that we are listening to different points of view, people who disagree with you, and then making a decision from there. And then making sure that teams are executing based on the decision that's been made, even when you disagree with it. Yeah. Right. That is key. Yeah. You know, Rohit, I've, I've often said, uh, I agree to disagree, but not to be different. Right? True. Uh, I, I don't take myself seriously, but I take ideas seriously. So I think, uh, and that's kind of the motto that I've always followed personally. And I've been on very strong teams uh, that were very competitive, uh, accomplished, uh, however, with the best products, however, they didn't, didn't succeed as, as a, as a team yet individually, you know, we had some great, you know, players. And, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that every single conversation becomes a reference point. And I'll, I'll reference someone, uh, from Amazon, who's the first global director of diversity, who, told me that her husband was a coach of a basketball team that was a state champion. Uh, and uh, one, of, uh, one of its players was a bench player uh, that had been a uh, tennis champion you know, for three years running in his state as well. But he ended up sitting on the bench the entire season. But when they won, when they lifted that trophy, he said uh, he had never been happier in his life. This was his biggest accomplishment in his life of being a a champion on a team rather than as an individual, as a ten tennis champion. And there's something very special, you know, and that's and, and, and important to be said about being a part of championship teams, right? Where uh, championship teams uh, will always beat a team of champions any day, probably, right? Um, and, and you mentioned lots of important, uh, I think, aspects regarding the diversity, the, you know, of, of uh, people and individual players. Uh, and the environment, right? The, the importance of the environment. That has to be balanced with accountability, right? Where if I have a colleague of mine, a peer, and they ask me to, to, to get a project done, chances are because of the hierarchy, I may not be as likely to complete that project in time compared to if somebody who's my manager, right? Asks me to do that. Unless there is an environment and a leader who creates that uh, collaborative environment that you talked about. I think that's what my takeaway is from, from your comments. So I, I agree with you. Uh, and I love that story that you just shared about the uh, player who was sitting on the bench. I mean, you know, we all have uh, uh, role players in our lives, in, in work, even in our personal lives, right? That mm -hmm. have helped you in different ways. And, and uh, you know, and sometimes I know I play a role player. Like right. you don't have to be of the center of every decision-making and, and you don't have to be the star of every right. 
play, right? Sometimes yeah. you have to kind of take a step back and mm -hmm. just support someone else in the effort that they're executing on or uh, on a work stream where you are just a role player. And that's okay. You have to be very comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to remember that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's one of uh, my, one of my favorite questions, you know, uh, during the interview process is like, tell me about a time where you were just a role player and tell me about your contribution to either the success of the product or not the success of the product, mm -hmm. right? And tell me why that happened, right? It's a interesting way of uh, understanding, uh, can they be role players? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. that humility that comes with that is really critical. That's why going back to the original point, culture is where it all starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and being a role player on a team that also fails was also an important point I think that you just brought up. It makes me think of uh, Winston Churchill's quote that uh, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. So I think that's what <laughs> you bring up. It's a good there. one. <laughs> right. Yeah, so here's another uh, topic that I want to also touch upon with you, Rohit, which is another one of my favorites, which is metrics, performance metrics. So do you think that performance metrics or KPIs can be designed in a way to stimulate collaboration as well as some healthy form of competition? Um, I am not an expert in KPI, so I'll start there, Tim. Okay. All right? yep. But we are building KPIs around net promoter score mm -hmm. uh, for our team members to make sure that our partners and our clients uh, uh, rate us. And I will tell you, Eversana net promoter score is very high. Uh, when you compare it to some of the well-known brands as Amazon and Apple, mm -hmm. it, it's something that we are very proud of. Oh, um, uh, and then the internal aspect, what we're doing now in terms of uh, evaluating, and this will be, we're just rolling this out, uh, uh, given that I've been in this role for one year and we are learning and evolving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As of 2022, so for the year 2022, team collaboration and uh, alignment and cohesion is going to become fundamental, one of our metrics uh, that we will track as part of your variable comp. Mm -hmm. So it, I think, has a certain distribution based on your total target. And the way we are going to do that is we actually talk to the program teams or the brand teams within each of the partners that my team supports to get feedback. How did this person do? Did, did you feel included? And did you know what decisions were being made, right? And then again, there's some balance there because we talk about transparency, but not everyone needs to know everything, right? And there's, right. It has to be some level of filtering. Mm -hmm. But if people, if the team members understand and feel included and feel valued um, and the uh, person that I've put on a program to lead that program is doing a really good job, program will become successful, All right? So we are putting some metrics around that. Um, and then we've also created some frameworks uh, and processes to standardize how we do things, mm -hmm. um, which comes from another key philosophy that we have, which is, you know, leaders have to be consistent and consistency just doesn't happen in not decision-making, but also execution. So you've got to build frameworks and processes that allow team members to be consistent. So it's both, mm -hmm. it's decision-making and processes. Uh, and we are finding out things that we've never thought of. So, okay, let's go get back to the drawing board and build it, right? So that's kind of our part of learning. And uh, so we are building that. And that's also the adaptation of those processes and frameworks in what we do is another part of KPIs that we're doing. So make sure that our team members are thinking about the right things. Mm -hmm. So behaviors in terms of team collaboration internally, mm -hmm. uh, behaviors to make sure our partners and clients are happy and believe you're delivering good quality results for them on their behalf. And then building processes and making sure that folks uh, on the teams are following those processes. If you can kind of make sure those three KPIs from those aspects are being measured at the end of the year, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it also helps us have a very meaningful conversation with team members around those metrics. And we've taken a step further. We've defined what good, 
-hmm. subpar and exceptional looks like. Like we've defined right. those. So it allows us to have a much more realistic conversation yeah. uh, rather than saying, Tim, you did a good job this year and you have no idea how I arrived at that yeah. comment. Yes. Right. So we are trying to standardize things like that uh, within our team. I see. I'm very, very glad to uh, encourage to hear that uh, because I think you need more clarity. I think the time is now for delivering that clarity to teams to, to, to in, across our business world. And, and, you know, and uh, very recently, I actually uh, led a webinar uh, at the Ma Medical Affairs Professional Society where I uh, helped uh, communicate the need to quantify behaviors as well and to maybe adopt new perspectives on what has been considered a taboo topic of metrics in the medical division, not in the commercial division, maybe to reimagine it as a treasure instead of a taboo topic, right? You know, one of the things that you mentioned about metrics that made me think about also is, you know, metrics then also lead to how you think about your goals for the year. Right. Yeah. Right. There's a, it allows you to kind of become more focused that if these are the metrics, this is what you, this is what your goals might end up becoming. And there, you know, we think about goals in three dim dimensions, at least in our team. So there's the overall goals that are tied to our organizational performance, right? So these metrics have, have a say in that. We created a new goal that everyone has is around what I call corporate citizenship. Like mm -hmm. we all know what a day job is. Make sure you're doing something to help the business that's outside of your day job, right? So for right. example, my team is responsible for execution. Mm -hmm. but we've got them involved in our business development team, in other programs, in our functional solutions that each of our business unit executes because they are subject matter experts in different areas. Right. Why not go and help in different areas? And then the third dimension that we've kind of added uh, for everyone in our team is around something that's for you, right? So it's very deeply per personal in terms of this is what I want to learn. So I am not a patient services expert. I understand it about this level. Yeah. I have team members who are brilliant at it. Uh, we have uh, leadership in our business unit uh, that is incredibly uh, talented and understands this business so well. So I, I set a goal for myself that I need to understand the business. And I got a mentor from the patient services team for six months last year, would sit down with me once a, twice a month for an hour at a time, sometimes 30 minutes, would give me homework. And I started to appreciate the systems, the processes, the financials, the service offerings. Um, we encourage that with our team because you can always learn something more, right? So as a medical person, right. think about either complementary aspects of medical affairs, whether it's HEOR or MIPV, or think about things that are supplementary like market access, uh, field uh, sales, right? How do you learn about those functions? Right. So it allows you to think about as a medical affairs leader, what else could you be doing within, exactly. you know, legal guard, guardrails, right? So right. Um, we, I like to encourage our team to think about it because it helps you also be intellectually stimulated right. uh, mm -hmm. to learn something new rather than just doing your day job. Yeah, Rohit, this is really one of the fundamental reasons why I started this All Out Coach podcast, because it has allowed me to learn from various different leaders from across different industries and I integrate those concepts into medical affairs. So uh, I created this medical affairs metrics workbook that draws a lot of its concepts based on various different success stories from Adidas, from Slack, using Net Promoter Score that you spoke about as well and bringing them into the medical division as well, where we have really uh, pr presented me pictures or perceptions of, of reality, despite being in a scientific field, where I think that it's more timely and probably appropriate to uh, merge, merge the quantitative aspects of the role in order to drive and drive particular behaviors, similar to let's say a frequent flyer uh, miles program, right? That is an index uh, of your loyalty to an airline that's uh, converted into points, some point system uh, that nevertheless inspires you to fly farther and more often in order to earn that free ticket, for example, right? 
And, 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 and so that's, and I drew a lot of the inspiration from, believe it or not, a lot of commercial teams that were very competitive, that were force ranking each other. Uh, however, that I saw utterly enjoy their jobs and stand up for each other and stand up for medical too. And, and, you know, I drew, and I wanted to replicate that on medical teams, you know, and, and, and I think metrics can be one of the ways to do that. There's one negative aspect of KPIs, right? So we just sure. have to make sure metrics and KPIs, and we just think about them, you know, just like you have your incentive comp, you know, if you mm -hmm. measure the wrong things or you incentivize yeah. people to do the wrong things, you can do the wrong things. I think that's something uh, that we try to pay attention to here as well. And I would imagine most organizations do, right. um, you know, just don't do a check the box exercise on mm -hmm. metrics. It's like, that's think about point. what is the objective? Again, what are you trying to accomplish? Yep. You know, if it's just a number of KOL interactions from a right. medical perspective, okay, that could be a metric given where you are in your life cycle. Right, right. But were the number, the, the types of conversation, were you able to convert them to be a, uh, a, a uh, uh, to be get involved with your clinical trial, get them involved with, uh, you know, IIT studies or something in the vein of they want to become a, you know, pub, public, uh, public, uh, do publish on your behalf. I think those things are where you're focusing more on outcomes and quality rather than numbers only, mm -hmm. right? And their time and place for both. But yep. we have to think about this in terms of where a, uh, when we are looking at what kind of metric. I'm not saying one is bad or the other, but there is a balance uh, in terms of how you think about that. Yeah. Uh, there is a, also an approach that I uh, reference, um, which uh, comes from a classic business management case study of W.L. Gore as, and Associates that's been around for over six decades that has only a CEO and actually no hierarchy and where every single uh, employee force ranks at least 20 to 30 other people uh, with one uh, single criterion of the extent to which their peer contributes to the greatest success of the organization. And so uh, even in this type of flat you know, organization, uh, there is this emphasis on metrics and a distributed, more evenly distributed accountability that has led to six decades of, uh, of uh, success, of profit, without a, the annual year of, uh, that, that uh, demonstrated any losses. <clears throat> you know, so it's very interesting case study where they also uh, limit the its business units to less than 250 people. As soon as they become too large, they break them down and they co-locate them in proximal you know, regions so that they can learn from each other as well. But uh, yeah. it's an interesting case study on inspiring people's accountability. So I had this <clears throat> rather aspirational idea that I had shared uh, with a former uh, leadership team member of a publicly held firm. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, if the, at the end of the day, earnings per share is one metric, right? If you're a publicly held firm, that kind of right. drives stock price and a lot of, aspects, right? Uh, I mean, it's not just earnings per share, there's other things, but if earnings per share is one of the key metrics. So I had this, again, very aspirational idea. What if every team member, say you have say 10,000 employees, every team member in that organization based on function has their own metrics based on the vision and the objective of the departments and mm -hmm. teams. But the only, the, those metrics only come into play if you miss the earnings per share metric, mm -hmm. right? So everyone is focused on earnings per share as a priority metric. Right. So can you imagine, again, I, this is a conceptual discussion, right? It's maybe very academic. I thought it was very aspirational. Uh -huh. Imagine the silos that will be broken if everyone just starts looking at that earnings per share, and it may also lead to some bad behaviors. So I'm, I'm, it's not lost on me that it could lead to bad behaviors. But if we can figure things out where it's having very specific metrics that focus everyone on the greater good, mm -hmm. but if you miss that 
key metric, your individual metrics come into play. So it's not that we discounted your individual metrics, but the goal or the objective or the intent is we got to hit this organizational number. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And, and that is something that, again, I've thought about, we could write papers on it, debate it because they're obviously, it's like I said, very aspirational. We could collaborate on it if you like. <laughs> we could, yeah. <laughs> you and I. But it might, it, it might kind of make us think about like how unrealistic is this, yeah. and what are the pros and cons, and how would or how should organizations shape uh, uh, compensation and metrics to make sure that we are thinking about the organization first, mm-hmm. not individuals or departments. Yeah, and the individual goals that you talked about, right? Autonomous goals are the ones that we are most likely to meet, to reach, based on a lot of the data. You know, data. Marcus Buckingham and a lot of the research that I've seen in management. So I'm really glad that you're emphasizing also the, the that you know aspect as well, right? The, that that autonom- autonomy, if you will, right, or the freedom that you talked about. So, uh, so the next question I want to ask you, Rohit, is uh, in regards to inspiring teams after successes or failures. How do you recalibrate teams uh, in different situations? Because that's when the culture seems to scatter most based yeah. on observations, right? In successes look, or failures. The... the, the... The way I look at it is, look, every team is going to have a failure at some point. It's just the nature of what we do as, as professionals. And, and the mark of a good leader um, or a good team is how we react to when things fail. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've tried to cultivate in our team is we will not point fingers. We will ask questions. We will try to understand. Uh, we will work with anyone who wants to work with us and our, uh, and our colleagues within Eversana and focus on the problem that we're trying to solve. <clears throat> I also found like in some discussions, you know, p- people have their points of view and they go into tangents and we always say, I hear what you're saying. Can we, but this is the problem I'm trying to solve and I need your help with solving this problem. Right. So it changes how folks show up. Um, and when you have a misstep, right? I always say when I, when I was a kid growing up and I did something wrong, my dad never yelled at me. I felt bad already. <laughs> you know, it's like, so if you hired the right type of people that are good cultural fits, they know they made a mistake. So you say, hey, what happened? You listen, right? They don't need to be yelled at. They don't need to be... Uh, you know, uh, 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 scolded. They're not children. These are professionals. You need to hear what's going on. Why did that happen? Mm-hmm. How do we fix the problem? And trust me that that person is not going to make the same mistake again. Mm-hmm. They may make other mistakes, right? Yeah. But it's how you react at that point. And you have to, as a leader, breathe when that happens. Because I'll tell you, when that happens, even in, organ- in, my, in our team, my first reaction is, as a human being, is like, oh, my God. And then you have to remind yourself, like, just take a step back, breathe, and then have a conversation with the person and say, okay, tell me what's going on, right? right? And team members will tell you, yep, yeah, blah, 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 and we've got this fixed, and we, we've just had this situation um, this week, and it's only Tuesday, you know? <laughs> we've been working on this thing for five months, and one of our team members raised this issue on Friday when a pilot program was supposed to go live yesterday. So my first reaction was, why are you raising this now? You've had five months to bring it up, right? <laughs> right. But if I had approached the conversation that way, right. it wouldn't have gone anywhere. Great. Example. So we had a discussion, brought everyone together. I made my point about guys we had five months why are you bringing this up now but it was more about once you heard the points that were being made you realized that of the five points two of them were very valid and we missed that so the conversation quickly went to why did we miss it what do we need to do to fix it Mm -hmm. so we delayed the pilot by a week Mm-hmm. everyone's getting involved. We have a legal team, a finance team, my team, our partners, everyone's involved and we'll sort it out, right? But how you react 
at that moment is how other people will respond as well. Yeah. So you have to, as a, any leader or any person who's in that situation is, you know, one of my executive coaches told me, you just got to breathe sometimes and just right. think about the consequences of what you're going to do before yeah. you do them. And then it'll, it will um, change how you approach a situation, a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you start taking things too personally, that's the end of it. Right. right. You've got to maintain some distance on what the issue is, the personalities in the room and, and make sure that you're thinking about the right things. And if you don't know, ask, Hey, I'm not getting this. Can you help me understand this? Right. And if you start getting people to open up, a lot more things get done. Um, and, and this will happen over and over again. And, and trust me, I will make a mistake too. It's just yeah. human nature that at some point, you're going to do that. You make a mistake, you recognize the mistake, you apologize, make a note that you don't make the same mistake again, right. and you move on. It's just the nature of leadership. Yeah, that subtle detail and uh, is so critical. Thank you for sharing that lesson there, Rohit. Uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, a, a lesson that I, I remember from my grandmother, who was a huge mentor and who was a professor and a teacher, you know, for many, for over three decades, who told me, don't ever make permanent statements based on temporary feelings. And she was great about that, you know. And <laughs> Wise lady. So, yes, yes. A sense of belonging. Uh, is something that I want to also touch upon, uh, belonging to teams. From your observations, uh, working, advising many global corporations, do you think that that sense of belonging to teams as well uh, as a result of that environment is what helped them succeed? Uh, Yes. Look, there's different types of folks and each person may have different objectives and, Mm -hmm. you know, professional goals. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize that, right? Uh, I used to, early in my career, my biggest stress point was not sales, not delivery. It was when someone resigned. Mm -hmm. It used to really stress me out. And then it took a little bit of maturity and growing up as as an individual to realize that people have to move on. Right. And I may have to move at some point right? Or be moved at some point. You never know, right? It's just the way things work. But as while you're in the role, you have to create an environment where people feel valued and that they are providing input. They feel like this is, that their work is being valued. Um, They're seeing results, uh, that they uh, have someone who cares for them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, uh, so I heard this great quote from the new New York Giants coach uh, yesterday. Um, people don't care how much you know, but they know if you care. Right. It's kind of a nice twist right. on know and care, right? Yeah. Uh, and that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Because if you care, people re- recognize that you care and they show up that way. Mm-hmm. They will call you when something goes wrong and you won't hear about it from like five or six person removed. You're getting from that person, hey, I just want to let you know something happened. Right. So you you hear it from me first, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that is important. Uh, but you have to also... Between, yeah, there's, there's a difference between sharing words, sharing information, and sharing feelings. There, a lot must be said about that because that's when maybe you're also more innovative when you're able to share feelings openly with others and belong. I, I think, look, feelings... Uh, I heard this, this idea of authenticity and people right. showing up as they are right at work. Right. And, and, and there's, va- there's, we need to mm-hmm. within reason, there's an HBR article saying, be yourself, but be careful of being yourself oh, as well. Yeah, right. So, so because you never know the environment you're in and you have to be smart about it. Don't be naive into walking into a situation uh, and doing something that may not be perceived because it's not a cultural fit or, you know, I think there's, I always, um, and maybe this is just because of my age, it's, uh, there has to be some level of formality at work, but also collegiality, right? So going back to your point about hierarchy, right? I never feel people's titles in my, in my current environment. 
uh, at Everson, I don't be people's, I never have been made to feel people's titles. It's very refreshing, right. but I know who's who. I know where they sit. And so you have to respect that. You have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And you have to uh, show up differently, right. but still speak your mind. So that goes back to like, you've got to make yourself heard. You've got to speak your mind, whether you agree or disagree uh, on a specific topic that you're discussing. But there has to be some deference for that person or the title or, you know, uh, that you're that who is in the room. Uh, and it's just being savvy about it. Rohit, in the real world, people change many teams. They may belong, they may be attached to a great team, have a great environment. And that's the reality now, right? And what uh, many people call this, uh, the gig economy, right? Which I don't like to, to use as a cliche, <laughs> but here I am using it, I guess. But, but look, that's the reality, right? That people have to transition from one team to the next uh, and not necessarily from one job to the next, but also in a role such as, uh, such as yours, that's a very important role, right? You probably uh, manage many different teams or you probably have to take your hat, one, you know, uh, one hat off and you know, put another one on in different things. So how do you transition from team to team? So um, there's two ways of answering that, right? So if you're an individual contributor you know, as, and you're working for an organization, you want to have a mentor or some platform that allows you to kind of grow, yeah. right? So the professional development plan, and even my team, which is very new, we are thinking about that all the time, right? You know, if we create this role, we can take folks that come in from here into right. here and then move on here. And as we figure these things out, we will communicate with our team, right? So that's at an individual level, you want to have that where you feel like I'm not stuck doing the same thing forever. Like someone's asking me the question, so what's next for you? What are you interested in doing next, right? Even I asked myself, I've, I've actually had conversations with my manager right now saying, you know, if this opportunity comes up, I would love to be able to do that, right? You have to, as an individual, have that conversation with your manager. And as a manager, you still have to think about how do you keep people excited about being at work? So people leave because they are either bored or the manager is not very good. They're not looking out for them. That whole thing about caring and, right. you know. Um, so the gig economy is real. It's here to stay. <laughs> you know, it's not going away. But right. will, it, will it continue rising or will it kind of subside over time? We don't know, but it may subside. It's possible. Um, the second thing is, as I think about teams, right, you have to now be very aware of what is being asked of you. So if I'm a contributor again, mm -hmm. even in my current role, if I'm asked to sit as part of a team, the first thing I have to ask is, why have they asked me to join and what is my role? Because I said, sometimes you lead and sometimes you're a role player, right? Or you're a contributor. Yep. And you have to be comfortable being that. You don't always want to like take charge. You will not be successful. Mm -hmm. So Allowing that flexibility and having the intelligence, there's that whole emotional intelligence piece of it to kind of realize that and then model your behavior accordingly and your contribution accordingly allows you to move from one team to another or, and teams could be a task force, it could be a COE, it could be your day job, right? It could mean many different things. I've been asked to sit on diligence of a, a company that we were looking to acquire. I've been asked to do an integration of a company that we acquired, like lead that with someone. Mm -hmm. right. These are all very exciting uh, uh, and, and intellectually stimulating things. But mm -hmm. again, you have to know what your role is and you can't be the center of the universe in everything. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, And I think if you think of it that way, people will want to work with you more. You'll be more successful. Uh, you'll be heard more, yep. uh, you know, and people may still disagree with you, but you're part of the team. You feel, and going back to your original question, you feel that you belong then. Right. So it's not just at the individual contributor level that you have to have that mindset. You have to be when you're managing indiv individual contributors and when you become a leader of managers, right? So yeah. that mindset shouldn't change. It has to be, consistent it just you get better at it hopefully with time right. 
in the spirit of some advice to the next generation leaders, um, I want to ask you whether or not you think that everyone, regardless of their prior experience, should start building a team of their own. I think it will happen for folks that want to build a team. Mm -hmm. There are folks that are just good individual contributors and should be encouraged to be individual contributors. There's nothing wrong with it, right? Okay. Um, I have seen a major mistake and had many, many disagreements at one point in my career right. where someone who was just a phenomenal consultant and individual uh, uh, contributor that was a decent manager, but couldn't be a leader. Okay. Because very emotional, yeah, very emotional <laughs> person, I very emotional person okay. um, would always get stuck in the weeds and had to be involved in everything and could not delegate and just empower the team to do stuff um, and wanted to be in some ways the center of the universe, uh-huh. right? Yeah. But we kept promoting this person. And when I took over the team, one of the first things I asked, like, why is this person in the role? Should this person be as a manager? He was a decent manager. Like he really cared about his team. So there were a lot of positives. It wasn't a negative thing. Uh I just felt he was promoted to a level that he shouldn't have been promoted to. Mm -hmm. Right. So that happens in every organization. So I think when going back to your question around does should everyone build a team or have the, I think everyone should have the opportunity to do that if they perform, if they want to, okay. and if there's an opportunity, right? There has to be a balance between personal goals and organizational goals. So if the organization has an opportunity and you've been performing and it's time for you to, uh, uh, that you're given that opportunity, take it. If you don't get the opportunity there and you keep on looking for it, Right. Two things could be happening, right? Either you need to leave and find an opportunity somewhere else, mm-hmm. or two, you need to have a conversation with your manager. Say, why isn't this happening? So you can course correct what you need to course correct. Okay. Okay. But we may we should avoid making a mistake where you have individual contributors that are extremely good at what they do, right? Imagine your MSL that is just a rock star MSL that just gets it, understands it, and that's all they want to do. Right. Right. How do you keep encouraging them either through more responsibilities from from an MSL perspective? And if they say, I don't want it, then how do you keep encouraging them? That's the challenge. But if you yeah. promote them to become head of medical affairs and they don't want it right. and they don't have the aptitude for it mm-hmm. and don't want to change because they like the flexibility of being an MSL, they like the engagement with the customers, they like they believe they are making an impact and you're recognizing for the impact they're making. Don't change that because that's what that person wants to do. Because if you do that, then either they are going to leave or the team that's given to them will be very unhappy and they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. And it'll result in bad performance at some point, right? So, um, you know, when I was in consulting, I always said the best consultants don't make the best managers. The best sales folks don't make the best managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a different skill, but the good salespeople can definitely be trained to become good managers if they want to. Yeah. That's yeah. the difference. If they want to, and if they're willing to make the changes from an individual contributor to what it takes to be a good manager, that's the key. I see. Yeah. The self-drive that plays a big uh, role in, in, in the ultimate. And motivation. and motivation. And motivation. Yeah. Yep. And uh, informally, they're probably free to create their own support networks or mentors, right? But on a, you know, on a, on a from an organizational perspective, I, I appreciate your your comments so much. Yeah, I, uh, and look, mentoring is really critical, and and I encourage. So I get I have the opportunity to go talk to university students at Rutgers mm-hmm. uh, often enough. And one of the things I've realized that there is such a thing as a bad mentor. There is. Oh, interesting. Right. So it's not just just because you say you're a mentor doesn't make you a good mentor. So I've started to think about this a little bit more as what is the quality of a good mentor? Okay. 
right? I love this. And topic. a good, it's a different way of looking at teams as well because it's, right, right, right. Um, you know, the, have you heard about this thing called the trust equation? No. Look, look it up. Uh, okay. Uh, it's it's very it's an interesting uh, um, uh, way of looking at uh, trust from a mathematical perspective. It has a de- numerator and a denominator, right? So the numerator right. is around credibility, reliability, and intimacy. Intimacy is essentially around, you know, how honest can you be with each other without affecting the relationship in a negative way? Yeah. I'm very intrigued by that. It's uh, right. So because I, you know, at all out coach, I uh, translate uh, a lot of abstract concepts into exact sciences, if you will. Right. Like momentum, for example, like uh, the law of conservation of momentum is the way I explain conflict that happens. So I'm, so the, so the formula once again is. So it's credibility that. plus reliability plus intimacy, right? So this was designed plus- by. Reliability yeah. Plus intimacy over, and what is the denominator? So uh, the denominator is self-orientation. Self-orientation. I see. And, and this uh, this uh, formula was developed by a gentleman. Uh, I think his name is Charles Green, uh-huh. and we did some training on it. He runs a company called the Trusted Advisory Advisor Group. It's a phenomenal concept. Um, and if you think about mentors, it's that denominator that becomes a very critical component because credible, reliable. Yes, that's all right. good. Intimacy is okay. Self-orientation. Right. Is it about you or is it about the other person? Yep. Yep. Right. So a good mentor will make you ask, will ask questions and make you arrive at your own conclusions mm-hmm. without you ever feeling that they're pushing you into a direction. Great I've advice. had mentors that I thought were really good mentors, right. but there was always a hidden agenda. Yes. And it took a while to realize that. And then you go down a path and you were like, why am I doing this? I agree with you. Right. It's so this idea around caring and making sure it's about the other person and making them think about the right questions uh, will tell you if that person's a good mentor or not. Thank you, Rohit, so much. I, I agree about that uh, wholeheartedly. You know, I think the time also is the best test of uh, true mentorship and whether or not you ever doubt that they have your best interest. In fact, when I started to, when I called myself an all out coach and I started coaching right three years ago was a very transitional time in my life. And one of the first videos that I posted on LinkedIn was that I know the responsibilities that come with coaching, with mentoring, that no one can, will ever doubt that they have to be absolutely confident that I have their best interest. So I completely agree with those sentiments there. Yeah. Rohit, thank you for actually for bringing that up. Um, so Rohit, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed this. I know that many of the listeners uh, and also those who are going to watch uh, are going to appreciate this uh, conversation because I think you have redefined what teams are, that teams are not just a group of individuals that think the same, that dress the same, that uh, do the same things, but that look out for each other, that uh, help share opportunities to win and also that uh, that warn about uh, different threats right and help other people avoid them uh, and and I think you've really helped provide a very refreshing and very candid um, look at teamwork at belonging and building teams and you've also provided a great preview into what Eversana how Eversana is growing uh, and your journey. So I uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lim, I would like to give you the last word and share anything that you'd like with, with all our coach listeners or with your friends as well. Tim, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this was truly a, a privilege to be on this in this conversation with you. And good luck with all our coach. You're doing some incredible things and bringing thank different you. perspectives uh, to all of us on LinkedIn and other places. My you know, there's not much more to say other than, you know, you better try different things and be open to making mistakes. And hopefully along that journey of learning and making mistakes that you have a team or an environment that allows you to learn, fix and move on, right? Uh, If you're always going to be on the right track and making the right decisions, you're probably not pushing the envelope or 
you probably think you're always right and you may not be. I think there's, you've got to give yourself room to try different things and make mistakes. Uh, you know, it, it's, the, it's one of the things that I think about all the time. Uh, and the second thing I would close is just with, you know, you got to keep learning. Um, you know, read, learn, try different things. And the learning will make you think about different ways of how you may want to manage and lead your team. Uh, there are a lot of good insights from highly capable people that you can kind of glean from and bring it to your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work. So again, That's thank it. you very much for having me on. Thank you, Rohit. And maybe one day you'll teach me how to run the ultra marathon as well. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.